before you start doing the derivative or trying to find the derivative of an inverse trigonometric function, I think there's a few things you need to brush up on. I'm only going to show you one, but I want you to keep in mind how to sketch the other three trigonometric functions, meaning, well, we normally think of sine, cosine, and tangent as the ones we use all the time. Um, and I know you've probably memorized the graphs of sine and cosine, hopefully tangent, but I have a funny feeling students aren't as comfortable with the graph of secant, cosecant, cotangent. Um, so you also need to, based on those, maybe sketch an inverse trigonometric functions graph and just really have this idea of inverse functions in your head before we start doing the derivative. What does cosecant look like? Most students, once they've gotten to AP Calculus, have no problem with, well, cosecant of whatever, let's just say x is the reciprocal of sine of x. And they can say that, but they don't really think about the meaning. I think that's pretty straightforward. So this point right here, what is that? That's pi halves. Maybe I should do that in red. Pi halves, 1. Which means, well, what's the reciprocal of 1? One? 1. Because, what am I saying here? I'm saying, well, sine of pi halves is 1. So the reciprocal of sine, cosecant of pi halves, the same x value, is going to be the reciprocal of 1. And that happens to be 1. So we'll just keep 1 on there. And then we can think of, well, what about sine of, let's choose something else. What about sine of 3 pi halves? Well, sine of 3 pi halves is negative 1, which means cosecant of 3 pi halves is the reciprocal of negative 1. Oh, yeah, negative 1. Uh, maybe we'll do something slightly more interesting. Only slightly. Um, sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, which means cosecant of pi over 6 is 2 over 1. Oh, that one I can do. So that's going to be... Right about there gives us up to, I should be doing cosecant in one. And then I'm not going to write that in, but cosine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. So cosecant of 5 pi over 6 would also be 1 half. Let's put in that negative 1, all of that sort of stuff. Now, something is interesting is happening at What's going on at pi? Well, let's think. Sine of pi is 0. Cosecant of pi, well, the reciprocal of 0 isn't really right, but you could think 1 over 0. is you choose x values closer and closer to pi to put into sine, you get outputs closer and closer to 0, like 0 0.01, 0 0.001. And cosecant would have those same values as reciprocals, like 0.1 turns into 10. 0 0.01 turns into 100. So wherever sine is equal to 0, cosecant would actually have vertical acid effects. So hopefully you can fill in the blanks there, and you've you know, seen most of this before. And let's put in another vertical acid code here. Cosecant would look kind of like this. All right. Cool. Hopefully that's pretty good. And you could roll through that same idea of, hey, reciprocal values for cosine makes the secant graph. And you shouldn't expect that to look much different than this graph just shifted by a little bit. So what are inverse functions? You've probably memorized this or seen it in a class. Two functions, f and g, are inverses. If and only if, f of g of x is equal to x, and g of f of x is equal to x. And to me, that makes complete sense because, well, you're putting an x value into g, putting that y value into f, and getting the x you start with. But I found through the years that, hey, just explaining that doesn't work all that well. So... Let me go a little bit slower. f of g of x is equal to x means whatever the input is, right now it's just a white x, but you could think, eh, some number. 
um, is put into G, and then whatever you get out of G, that output is put back into F. And again, that makes sense to me, and I hope it makes sense to you, that those two functions would completely undo each other if this were true. So let's say F is X squared and G is the square root of X. X squared and square root of X are inverses when the input's greater than zero. And most people recognize that, hey, squaring and square root are definitely inverse operations. What does that look like? Well, if we say f of g of 9, what does that mean? That means we're doing, well, we're doing g of 9 first. We're doing the square root of 9. And then when we're done, we're squaring. f of g of 9 gives us, well, the square root of 9 is 3. Squared is back to 9. So we put 9 into the square root function and got 3. Then we put that output back into the squaring function and got the 9 we started with. So let's check this out with f of g of 4. f of g of 4, well, g is the square root function, so we'll take the square root of 4. f is the squaring function, so we'll square, and we get, uh, what, 2 squared is the 4 we start with. And then what about f of g of 100? Well, maybe we can do this in color. Maybe that will look a little bit better. So maybe I'll write the squaring thing first, because that's f. And then g is blue, so g is going to be the square root. I thought I chose blue. And we are putting 100 inside of there. So first we do the square root of 100, which is 10. And then we have to square to get the 100, or at least the same thing we started with. So that's what we mean by f of g of x is equal to x. The output to g is put back into f, and we get the x value we started with. Um, it also has to go in the other direction, that when you compose g of f, you also better get the same input. So in this case, now we're going to put the input into f, and that output of f is the input to g. So we will use x squared and the square root of x again. Um, but we're going to be going in the different direction. The inputs will be squared first, then we'll take the square root. So let's see what happens here. So we are going to square the input. Maybe I'll write three of these just to save time on the colored stuff. And I'm going to pick the square root. So let's see what happens. So I'll put 7 in here first, and the square root of 49 is back to 7. Hey, that seems right. I, I squared 7, took the square root, got the 7 I started with. What about 3? Well, 3 squared is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3. No problem there. And what about negative 2? Well, negative 2 squared is 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. Hey, that doesn't work, because I didn't get the x I started with, which is why we have this caveat. Hey, x squared and square root of x are only uh, inverses or x is greater than or equal to zero. So we should have seen that coming. All right. So the red curve in this graph is everybody's favorite, sine of x, and that contains the point pi over 6, 1 half, which is, mm, I don't know, somewhere about there. That seems about right, pi over 6, 1 half. And so we actually, if you notice, look closely down at the bottom in the top of the graph, that inverse sine graph, the blue graph, um, just stops. It, it doesn't kind of continue back, making more of a sine curve. And that's because the inverse sine function has to be a function. So its domain is restricted. I'm not going to say a ton there. Um, so... Finding the derivative of sine at pi over 6 isn't terribly interesting. What's slightly more interesting is the derivative of inverse sine, this blue graph, at 1 half pi over 6. And the reason that's interesting is, interesting is in quotation marks, we're talking about calculus here, that may not be true for all of you. Well, in a certain way, um, pi over 6, 1 half in sine, and 1 half pi over 6 in inverse sine refer to the same point. The, the x's and y's have been reversed, going from sine to its inverse. Let's take a step back and remember what we're really saying when we find a derivative. Well, 
when you find the derivative, let's say of sine of x, we're talking about, hey, what's going on between two places? One, let's say at x, and one, well, let's say, instead of x, how about pi over six? And one at pi over six, um, plus some horizontal distance. Ooh, that was ugly. One more time where this horizontal distance is h. And what do we say? We say, hey, if we're going to find this derivative, the limit as that horizontal distance between the two points shrinks to 0 of sine pi over 6 plus h minus sine of pi over 6 over pi over 6 plus h minus pi over 6 well, what happens? What we're talking about is taking the slope, uh, anything but blue, the slope of this secant line connecting the two points and moving this second point closer and closer and closer so that instead of finding the slope between two points, a secant slope, we're almost finding the slope at exactly one point, which we call a tangent slope. So if we think about this idea of inverses, we can kind of be doing the same thing or something very similar um, over here. But now instead of the horizontal distance between these two points being h, now it's the vertical distance between the two points is h. Because really, all we're doing to go from a function to its inverse is switching the x's and the y's, the inputs and the outputs. So the slope at, of sine at pi over 6 is definitely going to be related to the slope of inverse sine at 1 half. So we can do this a couple of ways, but, you know, the easiest way is just to say, okay, so dy dx, the derivative of sine with respect to x is cosine of x. And then at x equals pi over 6, well, dy dx, or the, that instantaneous slope, is going to be cosine of pi over 6, which happens to be square root of 3 over 2. Hmm. So a little less than uh, positive 1. Does that seem about right? Oh, shoot, that was the wrong color. Um, I should have been doing this in red. Oh, whatever. Too bad. So does that seem about right? This slope right here is about, uh, what is that? Square root of 3 over 2, more than 1 half and less than 1. Sure. And so do you have a guess as to the derivative of inverse sine or the slope of inverse sine at the corresponding x value 1 half? Well, there are a couple of ways to go, but I mean, the preview is just anything but red. The preview is just, well, the derivative um, evaluated at x equals 1 half is 2 divided by the square root of 3. Um, the reciprocal slope as the slope, the instantaneous rate of change of sine at the corresponding pi over 6. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next video.